Hi, Andrea. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Tim. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm well, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of NeoSurf payments and esports today. And to, uh, to start off with, uh, the floor is yours. Can you sort of give us an introduction into, into yourself and NeoSurf and what the company does? Yeah, sure. Um, NeoSurf have been around since 2004 and in the same space as PaySafeCard and what was Ucash? Um, kind of the number of us in the team here at NeoSurf that used to be at Ucash, I was at, U at Ucash. Um, our own rails, our own payment method, it's an alternative payment method in the gambling industry's terminology. Uh, local payment is something that people use more now, which I'd much prefer. And we produce prepaid vouchers, essentially. Um, but we have our own technology and we're across 58 countries. And we reach customers that want to use NeoSurf on a secure or even hiding in a legitimate manner, not a illegal manner, hiding transactions of gambling on from their bank account, sometimes their spouses, but generally from the bank account and, and different areas. But we also reach into areas, so we're across uh, a lot of West Africa and 38 countries in Africa where banking isn't that easy and we connect to wallets and we can buy our vouchers through wallets. So we reach a local payment method and we deliver that into a number of sectors and the gambling sector is a significant one for us. I said before, I, I come from Ucash. I was in between Ucash and Neosurf in the in lending industry. I used to work at Wonga. But we came in 2015, at the end of 2015, PaySafe had bought and killed the brand Ucash. And Nicholas, who is the president of the company, saw an opportunity, but realized that we needed to put some real effort behind the commercial side. So we brought in a few Ucash people and we've brought in Lots of other people. The business has grown exponentially since that, those days. Um, and we now have a team of about, there's a 30 people here based from the UK. We've got people in America, people in Israel, a team of 20 developers in Israel. France is still our headquarters. Struggled the most with all the COVID stuff in and out of the office because it's a Paris-based office. We've got people in Australia. And we've got a few offices in different, different countries as well. Um, and we're a very, very strong team getting out there, pushing as the alternative to peso card and doing really well and enjoying ourselves. That we're doing. Well, that, that's good to hear, certainly the last part. And, and definitely, you, you know, you've talked about a, a very broad scope there. Uh, something I wanted to ask you specifically about is, is something maybe a little bit more specific, a little bit more of a, um, uh, a narrow focus. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, focus and, and the work you do with the the esports sector? Yeah, so yeah, this is it's interesting because we're talking about gambling here, but one of our sectors that we're growing in is games, and we we went into esports sponsorship, and we've learned so much. I just can't begin to tell you how much we've learned. We started with a team here in the UK, which became a bit too expensive for us. It's like sponsoring a Premier team, Excel. And we did, um, in January 2020, we did a Near Surf Cup for League of Legends and the right games. I, the December before that, I had, was taken and introduced to what the eSports arena is and the fans of eSports, the League of Legends um, World Championship in Paris. Uh, I was blown away with the enthusiasm and the, mm -hmm. the quantity of people. And so we started to sponsor Excel. We don't sponsor Excel anymore, but we sponsor teams called the Dire Wolves over in um, Australia. That's been an amazing success for us. They've got teams across, not just your League of Legends. They've got various teams, like there's the FIFA World Cup coming up. And um, with working with them, we're looking forward to that in the, from a gambling space on where different people will be putting that through. And we have a pink the goalkeeper's shirt is in uh, pink, whereas the team's in green. Um, um, we've really got engaged in it. But what we've learned about in that is the enthusiasm, the size of the audience, the involvement the audience gets, and the teams and the games. I now can follow a League of Legends battle. And back in December, if Antoine's watching this, he'll be laughing at me now because I had no idea what I was watching in France. And then we've got the team Kick that's 
got a Portuguese element with about five different teams and a team in of, again, it's a League of Legends in Poland. So we're across Europe and we're in the Oceania League and the, the areas that we've learned and, and the insights of working with those teams and then relating that back, especially with the, the COVID and people say, oh, we're going to be betting on sports and esports and how does that cross over? And there is a crossover and it's growing crossover. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the very fact that and we used to use a terminology called endemic. We don't use it now because, of course, COVID, the word pandemic came out. And we, thought, we better not say endemic. Mm. But that's what we chose to do is actually get into the heart of it. And that's at the core of what NeoSurf do is that we're, payments are boring. We are a payment service, but payments itself is boring. The, the only way that we can really improve and help our clients is by understanding how to convert. So our payment mechanism has to be something we'll convert it into a deposit. And by doing that with the esports side, it's really taught us something to cross us over into the gambling side of understanding the consumer and the user experience. Um, I could sit here probably for hours talking about what we have learned with them. Hmm. The teams are all relatively young. The players are all very, very young. So if a football is burnt out at the age of 28, 35, somewhere between that, these guys are burnt out before the 20, maybe 22, veteran. Amazing people. Um, going to the training camp at Excel that was based in Twickenham, is based in Twickenham, was a great experience. Getting in the inside and the heart of what it was, and we produced that Near Surf Cup, and we took some um, gambling operators to this. And um, there was a point where they said, oh, my God, you've really got involved. I said, you can't pretend. You can't just step into esports because it looks big. Don't pretend. Get in there. Understand mm. it. And if you can understand it, you can understand the proposition. And then you can understand what you can do with it. And that now relates across into, this, into the online gambling space as well. But if you want to support team at FIFA, go and support Die Wolves. They're going to do really well. She's there. Absolutely, yeah. We'll definitely take take note of that. And yeah, very, very interesting kind of points. And, and like you say, lots lots to, lots to learn. And you have learned about esports. Um, back to sort of payments um, more generally. Uh, and you kind of mentioned kind of vouchers and things like this. Um, you achieve growth in the area of, of cash payments. And, and I find this quite quite an interesting topic because uh, you know cashless gaming is on the rise at the moment. And you know a lot of people say kind of cash, cash is dead and the future is all cashless. You know, what's your kind of thoughts on this, and especially given the growth you've had? So we've got some very interesting stats on it, um, and it's really helping us. I mean, cash at the end of the day was our core proposition. We you, you cash, pay safe card, DSF and others. And it's true that the, in certain countries, cashless and more digitized is taking over. And we've seen the growth go with that. We've seen a massive rise of online sales of our vouchers. We've done some data to analyze whether that is purely COVID driven or it's a pattern. And you can see with gamers and the pattern of timing that it's not just to do with COVID. What has it's been interesting, even in the UK and France as well, which is our, which is our first country, cash vouchers are still being bought. Whether people are using their cashless card in the convenience store during um, COVID, we haven't got the full answer to that. We, we, we bet that that's the case. But in some countries, cash is the only way. So we don't just reach your mainstream. Most of us who sit in this industry and talk about it live in a com country where we've got a card and that card can be tapped. And that's the way we, we're looking at it. Even I've, I needed to tip somebody the other day and oh, God, I haven't got any cash in my wallet. It made me giggle considering the business we're in. Um, but there are other countries that aren't like that. So cash is still important. Um, I had a lovely conversation about America. We're building our position. We'll be, some people call it, we're late to the game in America. I say, no, we've had to, we wanted to wait and see how things panned out. So it's our future plan this year, a uh, significant way along. And somebody said, yeah, gosh, cash isn't really important in the US. It's, it doesn't seem to be a cash place. I, said, I think that's wrong. You, you, cost you a dollar to breathe in New York still. You still have to tip people. People have cash on them. <clears throat> so we, we did a bit of a look into that. And I think Pay Near Me are, are doing a really good service out there. They've kept that going in that country, which is great. It's good, it's, good, it's good for all of us. But we did a bit of a survey about prepaid cards. 
and working with some of our distribution partners and reviewing, people are spending cash on gambling in America, but they're going in and buying a prepaid card and then using that to deposit. And I, I, it, it triggered to me when DraftKings decided to go into um, the prepaid card on the mile where you get all your other cards. And it is still important. Cash isn't disappearing. I used to work in um, a digital imaging industry and everybody said paper was going to disappear. I don't think paper has disappeared. However, there is a massive transition. Massive transition. So we're now about a third of our vouchers are issued digitally, uh, be it online or through our own wallet, my near surf. Um, and a lot of the vouchers that are bought immediately go in either by manually editing it in, or we've got products where it's using a barcode and it immediately goes into my near surf value. So the word voucher stays, cash is still there, but the growth very much is this, I'm going to use near surf to pay as, ex as a difference to using my bank card to pay for a security point, secret point of view. Easy use, the, the, the putting things into the wallet is there, but no, cash hasn't died still two thirds and it's the core competence of where we've come from and we're seeing it there and we're growing points of sale around the world now and it just keeps growing it's amazing yeah definitely definitely take your point about, about the cash and i think that the paper example um yeah is definitely fair because you know it's more likely that the trees are disappearing because we're still making so much paper um but in terms of you know like you said there is a, there is a trend of kind of growing digital how do you compete with the digital services given that there's, you know, there's a lot of competition in that area? Uh, well, we, we bring in two things here. We are more and more um, strength within our own digital service. So the participating with the online distributors is really supported our position in there, but it's our use of our my near surf. Um, uh, we call it an account, but you have to call it a wallet because technically and regulatory it's, it's, it's a wallet but it's not like some of the wallets out there. It's not a Nutella. It's, it's you load in, you get a near surf value and you spend that on where you'd spend vouchers. And what we've found is that by making that the best user experience and really learning how to make sure that the consumer, the player is looked after. We've spent a lot of time and money investing. Our growth has been thrown back into tech of user experience. And, and yeah, I keep saying that pay, I, um, I keep saying this, payments are boring, get it right. You just got to get it right. It's, it's a, you've got a whole lot of regulations. You've got a whole process there that has to happen. But getting it right to convert is about getting that digital process right for the customer. Um, less is more, simplicity, access of their own digital platforms that they've got. And, I, and then an example of this, I think, is in Africa, is... You, I, everybody says, oh, well, everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a wallet in Africa. No, they don't. They might have a phone, but they don't all have a wallet. There's the process of somebody's got a wallet and there's a community around them that use that wallet for what they want to do still exists. Growing, of course, it's not as if nobody's got it, but we're finding um, in Africa the digital purchase of a near surf voucher. From, I think we're connected to 72 wallets across Africa now, licensed out there. Um, and people using their wallet to buy a voucher, that's just keeping up with the process of how Neosurf works and choosing Neosurf to spend. And the My Neosurf process, making it in a simple, clean user experience and supported. Although that customer is a Neosurf customer, at the end of the day, they're spending their money on our clients, but it's our client's customer. So we take that quite seriously. And um, we've got dedicated team. Um, we work very hard to keep those processes getting smarter and smarter for the customer. And at the end of the day, it makes more conversion. More conversion means we're all making more. And that's what we're focused on. And I've got a really cool team working that all think the same way in that. And it's all about our client needs us to convert what we're doing about that. And that's from the, the tech developer who I don't understand. Apart from the fact his language is different, I don't speak tech. But they, we've all got that same ethos in our, in our business. Absolutely. The other side of it, by the way, is mm -hmm. um, it's our attitude. We've, we're, we, I say a number of us came out from, from the Ucash days. There's a key thing that we do. And we listen. So it's not just about the, the players and the customers. Of course, we care about that in conversion. 
we take an approach with our merchants, our operators, that we're not here, take it and leave it. We listen to you, we support you. And we were really proud to release something recently about getting us, we score ourselves on our merchant support, on our support of all of our partners. And we work really hard on that. Not just the support team, but the sales team, the account management teams. Um, and we take time. We don't believe in arrogance in this industry. We don't like the arrogance that exists in part of our role in our area of this industry. And we really fight against that. And we drive to keep the alternative payment methods and the local payments. There's a number of us that really strive to make this a collaborative strategic partnership. Just because we're payments um, doesn't mean to say, it's this is it, take it or leave it. That's what the regulator says. We work together and that, that's a passion of ours. And that in itself is making us compete. And every single day we get somebody else will knock on the door and say, you know what, it's time for us to add you in. Time for us to raise you up in the cashier page. And that's not just because we're growing. It's not just because of more countries. It's not because our fees are right. I would say it's about the people I work with, all my team, focused with our operators. And that's how you keep it. Digital, not digital. That's the way it works. It's the people that will count. Get off my soapbox now. Now, uh, in, obviously, in your, uh, you, there was a word you mentioned maybe two, three times, uh, regulator and re regulation. Um, it's something I find myself in every, in, well, if not every interview, certainly most interviews saying, whatever area this is, slots, esports, payments, uh, you know, online, offline, that, you know, regulation and compliance is, is a massive, uh, massive thing that we can't fail to mention. And uh, everything you've given, everything you've discussed, talking about uh, payments companies in gaming right now, what are the biggest kind of regulatory uh, concerns and, and things to, to keep on top of? And that's a very broad question, apologies. It is a broad question, but there is a simple answer to it, mm -hmm. actually, is that you can get anything that comes out as a regulatory requirement. You can get strong, clever, smart people that can interpret it. And then if you take Europe as an example, different countries interpret it different ways. You've got to keep on top of that. I was in a panel recently and um, there was uh, a couple of people. Tom Chandler was there and Olga from Paramatch and um, David Parker and we were all talking away. And um, they were all saying the same thing. So I've got, I don't know, let's take it. Uh, bored of PSD2, but PSD2 exists. You can be bored, you still got to do it. It's because it's boring to me. It's there for a reason. So you've got to believe in it because it's there for a purpose. And it's there for a very, very good purpose. Have people who understand it. Make sure you understand an interpretation. Don't be arrogant about it. We're not arrogant about it. We, uh, the, the guys that interpret our piece for our, ourselves, think carefully about how we're going to do that. And then we look into, as you may be Issuing vouchers in Italy is totally different to issuing vouchers here in the UK. Um, but we have the same, even though we're not part of the EU anymore. It's the same regulation, but it's an interpretation because there's a level of um, ability now for people to make their own use of that. Keeping on top of the interpretation is seriously important. It's resource hungry. Um, the biggest thing for us is... How do we make sure everybody knows how that works? You know, they're looking at digital platforms and how to do it. Created our own little knowledge box internally so everybody can be on top of it, at the levels they want. Um, and then get it right. And that then turns into the tech. I mean, we've invested in a platform. Called, we've gone on the platform called Laravel. Makes us agile. Makes us quick to change. If you see something that needs to be changed, we've got our own fraud and risk systems. And... It's, it's, and when I say I, I used to work at a company called Wonga that was massive in decision science, and I look at what our guys do in, in near surf and the cleverness that we've got. There's a guy called Olivier that manages that side, is absolutely intelligent. So you take your regulation, you understand it, you interpret it, you get your processes right, and that's, that's what we do. We've got policy process, evidence of our process that everybody can use at different levels, and you try to stay on top. But then what you do is you work with your, with your clients to make sure that that's right and that we're looking after that. And 
if I spot a fraud, not me personally, but if we spot it, that we know what we're doing with it. And it's how you execute it. Interpretation is a fundamental foundation. So how you interpret it, how you work with it, and how you absolutely set that out is, is, is key. The biggest problem, it's resources and knowledge and making sure everybody knows what it's about. But it's not insurmountable. You just get on with it and deal with it properly and pragmatically. It takes a lot of our time, though. Definitely, yeah. Uh, no shortcuts, essentially. But it sounds like they're one of your conclusions. There's no shortcut, though. Yeah. But you can make the user experience. You don't just make the user experience burdensome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that brings uh, that's a nice segue to kind of the, the final kind of topic I wanted to, to discuss with you. Uh, you talk about kind of uh, user experience. Um, how can payments companies really focus in on, on, on the customer, kind of the end user, given that a lot of financial services are currently suffering with kind of low customer scores on, on things like Trustpilot? Um, pain in my life. Um, there's a big issue in the digital space with Trustpilot in the financial. And um, I'm working directly with Trustpilot myself with the legal and product team. They're being fantastic in trying to help us. The principle of those is that if you've signed up and you've got a My Near Surf account and you've legitimately done that, but then you start to use stolen credit cards, well, I might close you down because you're, you're a criminal. You then decide, oh, I'm going to moan on Trustpilot. I'm going to, I don't like that you've done that. And that's what we're all suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, PayPal has one, one star. I think Trustly's like us, balances between 1.9 and 2 point something. So a couple of companies in our industry that have a lot more stars, but I don't know how they got that. I'm not going to quiz that. But I think fundamentally, um, the low scores are scored. But if you look at it, you have to respond to it all. You've got to do normal pro processes on there. But actually what that is, the majority is the people who have been, where's my money? Why have you blocked my account? And some of this process damages reputation, damages the way forward. And working together with people like Trustpilot is the way to do it. It's a, I remember being um, in a conference and there's a guy from William Hill who I have a lot of time for, was saying, in the UK, ASOS have more chargebacks than I do at William Hill. Why? Because I put time and effort into our systems to not have that. And then all the different ways. And again, it comes down to tech and user experience. So we're working really hard at it. It's very hard. There isn't a single person in our payment space or in one company that has a good trust pilot score. And it's because of their terms and conditions, which I endorse because it's all about fairness. And it's, oh, no, that person has an account. Yeah, they have an account, but they're actually a fraudster or a criminal. How do we solve that? And we're working on how to deal with the, how to block, turn it off, every, all the things that we can do to reduce the numbers of it. Um, but it's very heavily resourced, and it's, it's an issue. And it's not just trust pilot, but it is a very fundamental one. And I, I mean, I, I was looking at a major distributor for us. And they said, oh, I looked at your trust pilot school. Your trust pilot school is terrible. We can't take you on. And I said, all oh, right, do you use PayPal? Yeah, so you know that they're less than us. <laughs> I've never realized that. That doesn't mean PayPal are bad at all. They have the same issues we all do. But this format of, you could sit here and moan and moan and moan about it. Or you could do what that guy did at William Hill. You turn around and go, right, okay. How are we going to work on that? And I've got a team of three people working with me on this. And we're going to solve that problem. And we're, we're, we're in a good place, I think. And working without cheating. I'm not going to cheat. There's one thing we say. Well, it's a bit like you don't get no shortcuts in regulatory. In this place, don't cheat at it. Get it right so that you can stand up and keep your head up high. And I think that, again, goes all down to the, the fundamentals of I worked at UCash, loved my time there. Near Surf is a team of people. You've got people in France, people in the UK, constantly talking to each other. Don't really understand each other's actual language, but work all the time. And it's a very positive attitude to make it work. And if we can get that across within the operators for them to succeed, they can help us grow. They choose. A, they say, oh, can you open this country? with um, Riot Games, who run League of Legends, wanted us to see if we could get Morocco open. I went, 
okay, new one for us, go and sort that out. It was three months and we did it. And we, you know, that's, that's collaboration, that's working together. And that's, that's not being arrogant, it's about listening and caring and getting on with it. That's what we do. Now we are. For sure. Well, Andrea, thank you very much for your time. And you mentioned a couple of times payments is boring, but you know, there's certainly plenty to talk about with payments. It's, it's actually, it's very interesting and uh, quite fascinating. So yeah, thank you for your, for your answers and for your time. <laughs> They're not really boring. I've been <laughs> in it since 2007, but um, it's good fundamentals need to just be done. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, thank you so much. Um, it's cool. Have a great weekend. If I, yeah. It's, 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 have a great time. Yeah, you too. Thanks very much. Thank you.